This morning we're going to be in, John, in Mark chapter 14, and we're just going to look at the, the proposition, if you don't believe this, the fact, if you do believe this, God is in control. And I know that sounds like such an easy thing to say. It's like saying, God bless you, God bless you, or praise the Lord, praise the Lord. No, are we really praising the Lord when we say things like that? When we say God is in control, we all know it up here, especially on a Sunday morning. I mean, it'd be pretty foolish to say God isn't in control. But on Monday morning, on Wednesday night, on Saturday night, do we really grasp the fact, do we really rest in the fact that God is in control? When you get the bad report from the doctor, can you rest in the fact that God is in control? When your car breaks down, and it's going to be another $2,000 to fix it, and you don't have the money, and you have to decide about groceries and bills and what to do, can we rest in the fact that God is in control? When the most important relationships in our lives feel like they're crumbling around us, do we really, really rest in the fact that God is in control? Well, I think part of the problem is it doesn't always feel like God is in control. We often feel like this little guy on the beach where he can see the wave about to go over him, and we say, oh, don't worry, God is in control. It doesn't always feel, it doesn't usually feel like God is in control, does it? Because if God were in control and we're his kids, shoot, life ought to be smooth sailing, shouldn't it? We shouldn't get the bad reports from the doctors. God could, can God heal every one of us? Yeah, I shouldn't get one more gray hair. I shouldn't wake up in the morning and feel like I can't see my phone in front of me until I put it in the other room and find my glasses. God should just be able to fix it, couldn't he? He could, but he doesn't always. But that doesn't mean he's not in control. And I think we take it to one extreme or another, and we, you've heard that phrase, let go, or let, let go and let God. And sometimes we tend to get, well, we, we need to be careful not to get irresponsible in the fact that God is in control. That doesn't mean that it's not our responsibility to study his word. It's not our responsibility to live out his word. It's, it's, it's always our responsibility to go to work and to represent him well. We shouldn't be irresponsible with it or to say, oh, God will fix it because he's in control. He doesn't always fix it. Well, in Mark 14, we're going to look at that. We're going to look at a few, few principles from this passage. But you'll see that when you trust what God said rather than how your situation seems, you can rest in the fact that God is in control. If you, forget, if you, if you fall asleep in the next 30 seconds, it's fine. Just remember, God is in control. And when we trust what he said over what our situation seems, how our situation seems, that's how we can rest that God is in control. Three quick things that you're going to benefit from this. You can be who you need to be, you won't feel like you need to prove yourself to anybody. You can have the self-confidence to just be a child of God trying to live out his word. When we really rest in the fact that God is in control, you can be who you need to be, you can say what you need to say, and you can hear what you need to hear. Look at this passage again. We're going to be Mark 14, starting on verse 53. They took Jesus to the high priest's home where the leading priests, the elders, and the teachers of the religious law had gathered. What were they doing here? Do you remember in this scene? What are they doing? Where, Jesus is on trial. Jesus is about to be crucified. Verse 54, meanwhile, Peter followed him at a distance and went right into the high priest's courtyard. There he sat with the guards, warning himself by the fire. Inside, in verse 55, the leading priests in the entire high council were trying to find evidence against Jesus so they could put him to death. That would be like, I mean, is it stressful to be in court? Have you guys ever been in court for, I mean, even little things, you don't have to shake your head or nod your head, but I mean, even for traffic court, you know, I've, I'm sure I've been in court for a speeding ticket or for, oh, I remember how I got in court. <gasps> I was in court, I was in big time court, and it was scary this was before 9-11, mind you. This was before 9-11. But can I say that I tried to bring a gun on an airplane. I didn't mean to. A loaded gun. A loaded gun. And it happened. This is how stupid I am. It happened twice. One, Because I'm not a flyer. You guys know I'm a homebody. I like to stay home. Well, I'm also a self-defense kind of person, and I like to be in control. This is when I was, uh, Tony and I used to drive back and forth to Roswell all the time. Well, sometimes we were raising Tyler, and, uh, you know, sometimes Tony couldn't go with me. 
So in my bag, I always had a gun on the side because what happened? I mean, you just never know what happens. I mean, people are crazy, and uh, I'm not a vigilante, but I don't want to be a victim either, and I want to be prepared. So I had a gun in my bag, and um, we, so I just have this little travel bag. I'm not a big traveler. I don't have all this luggage. And we were going to go to Nashville for a medical conference. I had a medical conference, so I just grabbed my little travel bag, threw them. I'm a very light packer, too. I literally... I am a light packer. I have one carry-on always. I never check bags, you know, whatever. And um, I just threw stuff in my bag, and we're getting ready to board the airplane. And I see the guys behind the x-ray kind of point to the, uh, their screen. Well, then all of a sudden, there are like 10 people around the x-ray machine. No one's looking at me. Nobody's looking at what's going on around them. Everyone's looking at the screen pointing, and then it dawned on me. You know how you have this, this flush of realization where all the blood goes to your feet, and you go, <gasps> and I said, oh, that's mine. That's mine, and I realized what it was. So I started walking up. They were ignoring me. They couldn't care less. They're focused on the screen where they see a gun. And finally, and the, the police came. The airport police came. We got detained. They were very nice. They were very gracious. Um, I only ran twice. They tackled me once. <laughs> no, it was, it, was, it was humiliating. We missed the flight. We ended up getting another flight. S the police officer was very nice. So we went to court. We had to get a lawyer. The judge said, you must get a lawyer. Like, I'm demanding you to get a lawyer. So we got a lawyer, and y you always look at, you know, you hope for the best, but plan for the worst. You know, what's the worst thing that could happen? Never ask that question <laughs> in court. You know, what's the worst thing that could happen? It's frightening. Well, the police officer was so nice, so the police officer showed up at court just, and he said, I'm, I've come here to court just to make sure that Mr. and Mrs. Chavez get their, their weapon back. He was very nice. He was very gracious. Were these guys very nice? Oh, the second time, just so I don't leave you hanging. <laughs> second time, I'm so stupid, but I'm a private pilot. I fly a little airplane. Well, my mom um, used to live in Midland, Texas, and she was going to be moving to New Zealand, so once a month I was flying to Midland. So I was flying to Midland quite a bit, and I had my same little red, cheapo little travel bag, and I still had my little gun in it, and I flew to Midland. I can have a gun in my own airplane. Uh, well, the weather got bad in Midland, and I'm a smart pilot, so I wasn't going to fly back, so I got a ticket to jump on Southwest, and you just forget. It's not like I pull it out and play with it. You just forget that it's on the side. So... Thank you, Lord, that I was in Texas. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Because I went and I did the, put my, I had two guns at this point. Now I have two guns, both loaded, a 357 Magnum and a little 22 semi-automatic in my bag. And I put it through and the security guard or somebody said, is this your bag? No kidding. You guys know me. I'm not a very, I mean, I'm not like a crier. I'm not an emotional person where things just fall apart. I was so humiliated that it happened to me a second time. Tears just welled up in my eyes. And he said, oh, it's okay, sweetheart. Oh, it's like God miraculously gave me tears or something. I wasn't trying to. But he was this big Texan. Oh, it's okay, sweetheart. It happens. Don't you worry. All you need to do is call somebody to come pick these up for you. Is there someone you can call? <laughs> I couldn't, I'm not one of those, you see women who speak and cry at the same time? How can you do that? It's like you can't do one, you have to make a choice. <laughs> so I figured out how to call my brother, and then of course he answers the phone, and like, <laughs> hello? <laughs> uh, Lauren? <laughs> can you, I figured out how to get, can you come to the airport? And he's like, uh, yeah. So he came to the airport. I gave him my guns. He's like, you're such a moron. <laughs> he took my guns. Everything was fine. I didn't even get a ticket or anything for that one. Thank you, Lord, for Texas. So I know. So, but it was scary sitting in court and it was scary and everyone was on my side. There was nobody there to testify against us. We had a lawyer who was going to plead our case. We had the police officer who arrested us or who detained us. He didn't arrest us. I was never in handcuffs. But he detained us, and he was there to plead our case. Was that the situation with Jesus? Did he have a lawyer pleading his case? This says the leading priest, the entire high council, were trying to find evidence against Jesus. 
It's like the Supreme Court, instead of looking at the evidence, they were all trying to find evidence against Jesus. Why? Why were they doing this? To find justice, to find the truth? So they could kill him. So they could take an innocent man and murder him. Do you think that would be a little stressful? It says, but they couldn't find any. Many false witnesses spoke against him, but they contradicted each other. We read this story and we think, well, Jesus knew how it was going to end, so it didn't really bother him. He was a man. Did it bother Jesus that he was going to be crucified? Well, we know it did. How do we know it did? He asked the Lord. He prayed sweat drops of blood. He was in anguish. He was stressed. And it's horribly stressful. Oh, do you guys remember the story? Do you guys remember the video? Well, you'll see it here. But it's horribly stressful when you feel like others have control of your life. When entered the courtroom at 1243 this afternoon, the only thing he appears to have in his hands is a drink bottle. He takes a drink before sitting at the defendant's table. Two minutes later, Marin hears the jury's verdict. We, the jury, duly impaneled and sworn in the above entitled action upon our oaths, do find the defendant, Michael James Marin, guilty of arson of an occupied structure. Marin drops his head into his hands in despair, and then watch closely as he slides his hands up and appears to place something into his mouth. A closer look shows him even swallowing several times. At 12.52, Marin takes a final drink, and then a few seconds later turns and talks to the people sitting behind him. A woman hands him a tissue, and it's a downward spiral from there. He begins to convulse, at first lightly, but quickly it grows more violent. His attorney's calling for help. Marin hunches over, slowly collapsing to the ground as others rush in to help. And people start asking for someone to call 911. Several people ran to help him. About 10 minutes later, Cell phone video captures paramedics wheeling Marin into an ambulance. He was later pronounced dead. Do you remember that? That was just a couple years ago. Amy doesn't remember it because I can see the horror on her face. Where it was all over the news saying, did he, did he swallow something? Did he, what happened? Did he have a heart attack? Did he have a stroke? Or did he actually put something in his mouth? Uh, if you remember, he was, he was rich. And he was in a mansion. And he couldn't afford his mortgage payments. And so he set it on fire. And he jumped out of the window in scuba gear, but he jumped out of the window, and they found him guilty. The stress of having other people con controlling his life, he, the feeling that other people are about to dictate what's going to happen for the rest of the path of his life or for a decent period of time, was horribly stressful. And they did find that he did swallow cyanide. They found cyanide powder. He swallowed cyanide. He killed himself. If, now, let's just say he were in a position where, I, I don't know if he was a believer, an unbeliever. I mean, do, do believers sometimes do stupid things? Do believers get overwhelmed with life? Believers get overwhelmed with life. I don't know what his relationship was with the Lord, if he had one. If he could rest in the fact that even though he blew it, God was still in control, do you think he might have taken that news just a little bit differently? It still wouldn't have been a pleasant situation for him. He messed up. He's going to pay the price. But if you can just rest in the fact, now most of us haven't dealt with anything this bad, but we still feel oftentimes like other people are controlling us, like we're the victims. Look at this other video. Doamnelor și domnilor, senatori și deputați, distinși colegi, membri ai guvernului. He did not die. He did not die. He broke his face, but he did not die. Basically, it was, this was, um, ooh, I don't remember what country this is, but it's socialized medicine, and they had made um, a decision that whatever ailment um, his son suffered from was no longer going to be covered, and financially, he was going to be in ruins. It was just going to be difficult, and um, he had a shirt, something, I can't even remember what his shirt said, but basically, he was making a statement by doing that because he felt like he was being victimized by the government. Well, we don't usually get victimized that badly or we don't feel like we're victimized so badly that we feel like we need to jump like that. I don't know what he thought was going to happen to him. Again, he didn't die. But do you sometimes feel victimized by people in your life, whether from the government, from the IRS, from your employer, from your husband, from your wife, where you just feel like, I'm just a victim here. I just can't, you know, my neighbors are just horrible and I can't build a fence that I'm trying to build. 
and the things in our life seem so small, but they can still be overwhelming when we feel like we've lost that control. Because we feel like if we don't have control, somebody else does. But if we can just recognize that God is the one really ultimately in control, we can find peace instead of all the chaos going on. Look at verse 60. It says, Then the high priest stood up before the others and asked Jesus, Aren't you going to answer these charges? What do you have to say for yourself? But Jesus was silent. It made no reply. Why was Jesus silent? Was he throwing a fit? Why do you think Jesus was silent? I mean, Jesus could have started preaching. He could have told them all the truth. He knew what was going on. He had been preaching the truth for three years. They weren't looking for truth. They were looking at how to crucify him. He wasn't trying to hide information. He wasn't trying to be private with what he was doing here on this earth. He just knew they weren't going to listen. Now, some people... They don't want to give away any more information Spell than they have P-I-N-C-U-S. to. Spell it P-I-N-C-U-S. Date of birth? Why? What day were you born? No, I understood the question. Why did you need to know that? Let's leave it blank. Wait. Last night or this morning? You pick. 182 pounds. Number of alcoholic beverages consumed per week? Why did you need to know that? Well, they want to know. Well, I'm sure they want to know a lot of things, but I don't want my intimate details auctioned off to the highest bidder, willy-nilly. I'll put zero. Marital status? Pass. Profession? Irrelevant. Food allergies? I'm not going to be eating here. Are you allergic to sticking plaster? What a ludicrous question. I'm not answering any more of these, really. Do you smoke? Stop it. Do you wear dentures? Madam, listen. When was the last time you ate? Ah, a pertinent question at last. Yesterday lunchtime. Thanks for asking. I had a tuna sandwich. Toast was soggy, but... Did you drink the laxative solution? Yes. Did it work? It was as advertised. Did you evacuate your bowels? I drank copious amounts of drain cleaning fluid. <laughs> what followed was fait to come. Good. It, again and again. It was like a terrorist attack down there in the <laughs> darkness and the chaos, the running and the screaming, OK? Fine with me. Good. Gross invasion of my privacy, this. Wait till they get you in the back. <laughs> he was getting ready for a colonoscopy. <laughs> uh, some people don't want to give away any more information than they have to. That's not what Jesus was doing. Jesus had been preaching for three years. He had told them everything they needed to hear. But uh, basically, when you trust what God said, rather than how your situation seems, as Jesus did, you can rest in the fact that God is in control. Again, you can be who you need to be. Was Jesus being who he needed to be? You can say what you need to say, and you can hear what you need to hear. Let's look at a couple more verses. The rest of 61. Then the high priest just asked him flat out, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? And Jesus said, I am and you will see the Son of Man seated in the place of power at God's right hand and coming down on the clouds of heaven. And then they responded exactly how he knew they would. The high priest tore his clothing to show his horror, and he said, why do we need other witnesses? You have all heard this blasphemy. What is your verdict? Guilty, they all cried. He deserves to die. Was Jesus resting in the fact that God was in control? that his heavenly father could have called down angels to pick him up at any moment, that Jesus himself could have ascended at any moment in his own power? Yes. Jesus knew that God was in control, and he answered their question. He stood his ground. He was who he, ne he needed to be. He said what he needed to say, say, but the chief priests and the Jewish leaders still couldn't hear what they needed to hear because they didn't rest in the fact that God is in control. Unpleasant situations can be profitable. Was Jesus going through an unpleasant situation? Did you know that according to women, childbirth is the worst kind of pain there is? And did you know according to women that us men can't handle any of it? Well, did you know that according to men, women exaggerate everything? Everything. That's why we decided to make an appointment with Dr. Julie Masters. 
unpleasant situations can be profitable and they will give you a different Hi, how are you? Oh, good. I'm Dr. Julie Miasta. Hi, Hi. I'm Dan. Hey. Mom, nice to meet you. Are you guys ready for this experience? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Ready? What we're going to do today is we're going to put some electrode simulations on your abdomen which are going to give you some contractions so we can kind of simulate contractions to show what your wife went through during labor. That sounds fun. Well, we're going to hook you up right now. All right. Go ahead and lay back. Okay. What we're doing right now is we're just hooking up the contraction monitor. This like reminds me of those uh, yeah. infomercials. Nice and tight. Okay. Where they're like, nice and tight. Got it? I'm going to have a six pack after this. Hi. Hi. Here your wives. Hey, hey, guys. Guys. Right now. So I'm just going to give you guys a couple little contractions All right. so you can see what it feels like. How are you feeling that? Are you feeling it in your upper oh, belly? I'm feeling it right there. Right now we're going to be starting to simulate a little bit like early labor. Should be, you know, maybe like a two or three oh, out of ten in pain. Me. That was early labor. <laughs> <laughs> i got to remember my breathing. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's different. <laughs> Look at me. <laughs> <laughs> Talk to me right now. now. You're almost getting to like the active stage of labor where okay. it's really getting good. That was not good. <laughs> Unpleasant situations can be profitable, and they give us a different perspective. Now, did Jesus need a different perspective? No, he didn't, but he wasn't the only one in this circumstance right now. Remember Peter, verse 66. Meanwhile, Peter was in the courtyard below. One of the servant girls who worked for the high priest came, came by and noticed Peter warming himself at the fire. She looked at him closely and said, you were one of those with Jesus of Nazareth. But G Peter denied it. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. And he went out into the entryway. Just then a rooster crowed. When the servant girl saw him standing there, she began telling the others, this man is definitely one of them. But Peter denied it again. A little later, some of the other bystanders confronted Peter and said, you must be one of them because you're a Galilean. Peter swore, I can't. A curse on me if I'm lying. I don't know this man you're talking about. And immediately the rooster crowed the second time. Suddenly Jesus' words flashed through Peter's mind before the rooster crows twice. You will deny me three times. You will deny three times that you even know me. And he broke down and he wept. When you trust what Jesus said, rather than how your situation seems, you can rest in the fact that God is in control. Was Peter at that moment resting in the fact that God is in control? Peter wasn't. It's not because he didn't trust Jesus or believe Jesus, but sometimes we don't trust in the fact that God is in control. If Peter could have rested in the fact that God was in control, then Peter could be who he needed to be. Right then, Peter was not who he needed to be because he wasn't resting in the fact that God is in control. If Peter was resting in the fact that God was in control, he could have said what he needed to say. Yes, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. You're about to put to death an innocent man, the Son of God, the Messiah, who came to save you from your sins. But he didn't. And you can hear what you need to hear. The rooster crowed the first time. He didn't even hear it. People were giving him an opportunity to share his faith. He didn't hear that. But he did hear the rooster crow the second time. We all have moments where we don't really trust that God is in control. We all do when we're filled with fear, anxiety, worry, depression, anger, frustration, disappointment, stress, can you be filled with worry and still be resting in the fact that God is in control? 
Can you be filled with fear, overcome with fear, and still be resting in the fact that God is in control? I see a couple people shaking their heads. Now, can we fear? Can we be in fear and still trust that God is in control? Yeah. I mean, if someone were breaking into my house, I would have fear. But I should still trust the fact that God is in control. Does that mean that nothing's going to happen to me because God's in control? No. I might be in the middle of a very unpleasant situation that may become more unpleasant. But God is still in control. And we can, fear, we can feel some of these feelings, fear, worry, anxiety, but we should never be consumed by any of them. Wouldn't it be nice to feel like you're never consumed by worry again? You're never consumed by anxiety again? You're never consumed by depression again? I really think that if we could just grasp this one thing, it'll revolutionize our lives. Tony and I use the phrase a lot, God knows. That's another phrase that could be overused um, if we're just saying, ah, God knows. Ah, whatever, God knows. But we really believe God is in control. He hurt his back last week. He's still hurting this week, but he's starting to get a little better, but he's still, still having a hard time. But it was, you know, I don't know if it's just, being a wife or being a wife that's also a doctor, but when he's in pain and it's something I can't fix, I laugh. No, it, it, I, I, no kidding, it keeps me up like he'll wake up every hour and a half really in serious pain. And then I stay awake for another hour thinking, what can I do? What can I do? What can I do? And I feel completely out of control because I feel like as a wife, I ought to be able to do something. Shoot, as a doctor, I ought to be able to do something. But when that happens and I can't fix it, I feel horrible because I'm not in control. I text him, text him or, or messaged him at the office. And I said, I'm really praying that you will find some relief from this pain. And he texts back, God knows. And that's, that's, his faith of saying, God is in control. Now, the fact that he has faith that God is in control, does that mean his pain's going to go away? If he just prays it and believes it'll go away, does that mean it'll go away? No. We're trusting in what God said. And God didn't say, pray for your back pain to go away and it'll go away. Otherwise, he'd pray for more hair and he'd grow more hair. Or I'd pray for, I, I, just because he's sensitive about it, not me. I think he looks perfect. All that hair just gets in the way of his beautiful head. <laughs> But God does know, and I think if we just grasp that this morning, it will truly revolutionize your life. If we can rest in that, not just here, but here, so that when the car does break down, or the wife does leave, or the kid does get thrown into jail, or the grandson does get into a car accident, or we do lose our job, we can have worry, we can have anxiety, we can have stress, but we never, ever, ever again have to be consumed by them. Jesus was in the most unpleasant circumstance, but he still could rest in the fact that God was in control. Peter wasn't in that bad of a circumstance, but he was consumed by his anxiety because he wasn't at that moment resting in the fact that God is in control. Does that make sense? They were going through a very similar circumstance, except for Jesus was the one in the hot seat, but Peter was the one overwhelmed, not Jesus. But we have a hard time trusting in a God we can't see sometimes because he's not here right now to fix my air conditioner. He's not here right now to make my husband come back. He's not here right now to smack some sense into my kid. Well, we have, enough, uh, we have a hard enough time trusting in people we can see, don't we? And close your eyes and just fall down, okay? The so trust okay, then Lauren's going to catch you. Close your eyes. Okay. It's fine. It's okay, it's called the trust fall. Okay, trust fall. Ready? Set, go. <laughs> Bless her heart. <laughs> but unlike her eight-year-old sister and unlike all of the other people in our life, God is in control. God is in control. Get it in our, try to get it not just in your head, get it in your heart so that no matter what happens this week, you know how it takes a long time to develop a habit? but once you have it, it's pretty easy. We need to get into the emotional and spiritual habit of saying these words, of resting in these words. God is in control. During the pleasant times, during the un 
pleasant times. This was a very unpleasant time for everybody involved. But who was in control? God was in control. God is in control. Keep rehearsing it in your head. Keep rehearsing it in your heart so that no matter what happens this week, remind each other. Your husband goes through a horrible day. Say, I know, honey, it's horrible. Just remember, God is in control. I know it feels bad right now, but God is in control. Don't smack him with it. You know how people say, God works everything for the best. He does. He does. But it's, you have to be careful with how you say it. You know, just, oh, suck it up. God's in control. Oh, quit being a baby. God's in control. Have compassion on people, but remind each other, God is in control. Jesus was soon to be slaughtered, but he had complete assurance because he rested in the fact that God is in control. Where Peter, on the other hand, and the Jews were seemingly safe. But they had chaotic anxiety because they didn't recognize the fact that God is in control. When we get to the point where we really do trust what God said, not what we wish it said, not what we want it to say, not what we want to happen. You know, I'm going to, I trust I'm going to get this job because God is in control. God never promised you that job. You can pray for that job, but don't feel like God let you down if you don't get it. We're talking about faith is trusting what God said. That's what Jesus was doing. That's what Peter should have been doing. That's what the Jews should have been doing. But they didn't. Rather than trusting in what God said, they trusted in how their situation seemed. And that's where they blew it. That's where Peter could have had this peace and assurance. And instead of having assurance, he had anxiety. Where Jesus, if anyone should have had anxiety, it should have been Jesus. But instead, he had assurance because he rested in the fact that God is in control. The question is, do we really trust that God is in control? Do we really trust God? If we trust that God is in control, every single one of us would be saved. I don't don't know your spiritual relationship with the Lord. I trust that most of us at least are saved. I mean, shoot, I see you guys every week. But that doesn't mean we are. Just because we go to church doesn't mean we're saved. What's that phrase? Just like going to McDonald's doesn't make you a hamburger. Coming to church doesn't mean you're a Christian. Being religious, praying, You know, over 95% of Americans pray. Are 95% of Christians really saved, really on their way to heaven? Well, yeah, if they pray, they're on their way to heaven. No. What does it say? How How do we get saved? Well, how would we know? What does God say? And it's trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. That's how we get saved, by trusting in Jesus, not by praying, not by going to church, not even by reading the Bible. Reading the Bible only reveals the God who we're supposed to trust. If we really trusted that God was in control, would we all be baptized? Once we've given our life to the Lord, after we've given our life to the Lord, would we all be baptized if we really trusted that God was in control? Yes, because whatever's holding you back or whatever's holding us back, we moved the baptistry. It was here and it was here. Whatever is holding someone back from getting baptized, we would recognize That's not nearly as important as the fact that God is in control. Oh, but my hair will get messed up. Really? Seriously? Oh, well, I don't want to look silly in front of people, or I don't want to, you know, my family doesn't believe the way I do, and I don't want to disrespect my family. If we really trust in the God that is in control of this universe and our life, we would do what he says. We'd all get saved, we'd all get soaked, and we would all get serious about our faith. This week, really, I'm begging you, try with every unpleasant circumstance you have. Recognize the fact that the unpleasant circumstances, they may not be pleasant, duh, but they can give us a different perspective. Just like those guys in fake labor, you think they had a different perspective on labor after the unpleasant circumstance? It wasn't pleasant, but it did give them a different perspective. And sometimes we grow the most. You know, you want a pretty rose bush, and you have to do what to it? Prune it. God has to prune our life sometimes. Do you think that is pleasant or unpleasant when God prunes our life? It's unpleasant, but it's profitable. So a reader will often text me, are you having a pleasant day? Because we talk about pleasant and unpleasant, and now we text each other, are you having a profitable day? day because we recognize there's more to life than having pleasant days we want profitable days even if that means they're unpleasant because we rest in the fact that what 
God is in control. That was really pathetic. We rest in the fact that what? God is in control, pleasant or unpleasant. God is in control. Remind yourselves of that. Try every single morning, every single night to say, I have no idea why God is letting this happen, but I'm going to rest in the fact that God is in control. He's a good God, and he loves me. He wants what's best for me. He wants what's best for my kids. He wants what's best for my grandkids. He wants what's best for my wife and for our financial future. God wants what's best for me. And if things are unraveling and falling apart, apart, God must know what he's doing because God is in control. All right, let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that no matter how our situation seems, if we just trust in what you've said, we can truly rest in the fact that you are in control. God, whether we're having the best day of our life or the worst day of our life, whether we just feel like jumping for joy or feel like just not even getting out of bed, God, you are in control. And we, when we rest in the fact that you are in control, we can face anything, pleasant or unpleasant. We can face anything knowing that you are a great and loving and all-powerful God who loves me and who wants the best for me. God, whether that means pruning my life through unpleasant circumstances or just showering me with a few pleasant ones, God, you want what's best for me, and I can trust you no matter what. No matter what the doctor's report says, no matter what the IRS says, no matter what my bill collector says, no matter what the kids are doing or what's going on with the most important relationships in my life, God, you are in control. Help each and every one of us recognize that fact and rest in that fact so that we'd no longer be overwhelmed by the circumstances of our life. We'd no longer be overwhelmed with fear or worry or anxiety, depression, stress. God, we'd let go of those things because we know that we are in the hands of our all-powerful and all-loving Father. Help us trust you more and more. We love you, Jesus, and it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. God is what? In control.